This mass of ice is Glacier O'Higgins. It's been frozen for tens of thousands of years in the mountains of southern Chile. O'Higgins is spectacular for its beauty. But for a scientist like Gino Casasa, it's breathtaking for its speed. This was the glacier front position in 1896. Now O'Higgins is morphing into a lake, retreating more than any glacier in South America. The glacier was sitting where we are sitting right now. We would have been covered by ice. I think it's a very clear picture uh, that the world is getting warmer and that the impacts which were projected even 10 or 20 years ago are happening right now. O'Higgins has fallen back nine miles in a hundred years, throwing off icebergs that roll as they dissolve into the lake. We set out to find more evidence as Casasa went to measure the height of O'Higgins. We climbed to a spot where he crossed from earth to ice in 2004. You thought we were going to walk from here onto yeah. the ice. And now it's water. And now look at it. We have a small problem now. Much to his surprise, there's a thousand feet of water where he walked three years ago. We had to hike for hours to get to the ice, and when we got there, we found it blackened by earth and volcanic ash. Casasa set up a receiver to measure the distance from the top of O'Higgins to satellites overhead. So you get a contour line of the top of the glacier exactly as you go. As we walk, the receiver, which is in my backpack, is capturing data every one second. And the data showed him O'Higgins has thinned 92 feet in seven years. O'Higgins is not unique. More than 90% of the world's glaciers are retreating. And if you're looking for early trouble from climate change, this is it. Glacial runoff provides water for one and a half billion people, mostly in South America, China, and India. In the medium term, let's say, depending on the size of the glacier, uh, 30 years, just a few decades, the glacier will start to waste away in such a degree that you will see the runoff, the glacier melt coming from that glacier starting to decline. And, and these cities around the world will be starved for water. Exactly. So that's the major issue. And we see now the first impacts. We wanted to see the evidence of warming near the bottom of the world. So we set sail from the last city south, Ushuaia, Argentina, on a two-day voyage to Antarctica. It's more than a thousand miles from Glacier O'Higgins in Patagonia and across the Drake Passage to the Antarctic Peninsula. Here, we found there's green where the white used to be. On the coast in summer, there's grass where the scientists used to ski. This is Paradise Cove. It's home to fur seals, lazy elephant seals, and the chinstrap penguin. There's the chinstrap right there, right under the eye. American biologists Sue and Wayne Tribalpiece were the first to discover trouble in Paradise Cove. How have these populations changed over the years? They have dropped by about 60 percent. 60 percent? The tribal pieces live in this tiny American outpost where they've studied penguins for more than 30 years with a grant from the National Science Foundation. You know, I'm curious about the evolution. How long have there been penguins? Oh, millions of years. There have been six-foot penguin fossils found. Six feet tall six as me. Six feet tall, yep. And with ten-inch bills. And I really don't think I'd want to band one of those guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, closing around them. Banding modern penguins led the tribal pieces to their discovery. It starts with a roundup. They squeezed ID bands on 70,000 penguins to see if they survived their migration. Oh, excuse me. But after millions of years of this endurance, many chinstrap and Adeli penguins aren't surviving anymore. We knew something was drastically wrong. Something had changed in the ocean. What did you think was happening? We, we didn't really know. We knew it had to be something that was going on once they left um, land and went to sea. 
These are grown penguin chicks chasing their mothers for food, which she delivers beak to beak. Soon, the chicks will go to sea to hunt for a shrimp-like crustacean called krill. The krill grow beneath the sea ice, but in the warming ocean, the sea ice is melting away. So the penguins have been going to sea and starving to death? The chicks are declining, and we think they just can't find the krill. You know, when, when you can link a change in warming and air temperature through ice to krill to penguins and show a 50% reduction in the penguin populations here, and, and connect all the dots, um, you really can't make it any clearer than that. If it's clear the south is warming, Paul Majewski is here to find out why. We're just on the edge of something that is potentially going to be much, much bigger. Majewski is among the most accomplished Antarctic scientists. He's director of the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine, and he's been exploring Antarctica since 1968. They've even named a mountain after him here. Majewski is here to drill an ice core because when ice is laid down, it captures everything in the air. Drilling down is drilling through time. Well, the ice cores are really the only way we have of demonstrating what greenhouse gas levels were like prior to their first measurement by humans, which is really 1957 or so. By chemically analyzing the core, he can see what was in the air thousands of years ago. And one more sample will do it. Back in Maine, Majewski has a vault of hundreds of cores. He once led a team that drilled a glacier core two miles deep. He and his colleagues have found some of the most powerful evidence that man is changing the climate. What do the ice cores tell you about greenhouse gases? Now we know from the ice core record that it's the, the levels and the speed of rise are significantly, significantly greater than anything in the last 850,000 years and the levels that we expect to get uh, by the end of the century are going to be double what we have today. Majewski and his colleagues have timed the sudden rise in greenhouse gases to the start of the Industrial Revolution about 150 years ago. If, as expected, greenhouse gas pollution doubles by the end of this century, temperatures are predicted to rise four to six degrees. You could very well see sea level rises on the order of several feet and perhaps even several tens of feet. If sea level were to rise like that, there would be tremendous changes, immense migrations. You would potentially have millions, hundreds of millions of people yeah. who'd have to move inland. It would be the largest catastrophe that uh, the modern world had experienced. That rise in sea level would play out over decades but some of it may be inevitable. It turns out that many greenhouse gases last a long time in the atmosphere, and there's a lot up there already. If we stopped every automobile, every factory, every emission of a greenhouse gas today, mm -hmm. would the world continue to warm? It would certainly for a while. It is important that everybody really begin to to make reductions in greenhouse gases and, and all of the toxic uh, elements that go along with it uh, in order to, to impact or to have a change in the future. Uh, and once we start, it's not going to be an immediate solution. We have, we're going to have to pay for a while for what we've done.